much, Steve. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. Good afternoon. Uh, my book represents the first comprehensive study of the 5th Texas Regiment and the exploits and experiences of its brave men. Given its remarkable record as part of Robert E. Lee's shock troops through four years of war, uh, I felt that their story was long overdue and greatly in need of telling. During my research and writing, uh, I gained a deep-seated appreciation for the individual men of the unit. Regardless of their social or economic status, each believed in the right of their state to control its own destiny, and they were willing to die to preserve that, uh, which many of them did throughout the war. The 5th Texas uh, Infantry was one of only three infantry units from Texas to fight in the East as part of the Army of Northern Virginia. Its 10 companies were organized in East Central Texas in 1861 and uh, trained in Houston late that summer. Its first commander was a Marylander, uh, Colonel James J. Archer. He was a career army officer who cast his lot with the Confederacy. Now the men initially resented not being led by a Texan, but they grew to accept Archer because of his vast military experience. Uh, at the same time, Jerome Bonaparte Robertson, a respected physician from uh, uh, Independence in Washington County, was made the lieutenant colonel and this helped mollify the men's uh, initial resentment toward Archer. Prior to the war, John Cunningham Upton ran his mother's plantation at High Hill in Fayette County, which is about four miles to the northwest of Schulenburg. Initially a captain of Company B, by July of 1862, he was lieutenant colonel of the regiment. Rather eccentric, eccentric. He was noted for wearing a red undershirt into battle with an oversized hat, slouch hat, two six-shooters on his hips, an oversized sword, and often carrying a frying pan. By March of 1862, Archer had left to command his own brigade and Robertson took command of the regiment. He then succeeded to command of the Texas Brigade when John Bell Hood uh, was given his own, he was made a major general and given his own uh, uh, division. The 5th Texas departed Richmond in the fall of 1861 for Dumfries, Virginia, about 30 miles south of Washington, there to guard against any uh, Union southward movement. There that first winter, they suffered tremendous losses, not on the battlefield, but due to diseases. Uh, in close quarters, Suffering from the bitter cold, so unlike what they were used to, they were extremely vulnerable to uh, diseases such as measles and dysentery and pneumonia. Consequently, the regiment lost permanently over 260 men that first winter alone. Now being uh, 1,300 miles from home created particular hardships not experienced by other troops to the same degree particularly after the Mississippi River was uh, in federal hands and the uh, southern ports were blockaded. Food, clothing, sundries, and even letters from home were very scarce. While the men grumbled, as all soldiers are prone to do, they remained a well-oiled fighting machine. They were always prepared to fight to the last measure, leading Lee to proudly proclaim, the Texans are always ready. The 5th Texas' exploits throughout the war were exceptional. Three instances stand out more in my mind than any others as vivid demonstrations of the mettle of its men. At 2nd Manassas in August of 1862, the regiment found itself as part of a f uh, force charged with breaking the Union uh, left. As it plunged into the federal line, it encountered the 5th New York, known as Drury's Zouaves, which had rested in a uh, reserve near a low ridge with woods in its front. This same regiment had traded uh, vicious and well-remembered taunts with the 5th Texas 
that prior winter at Dumfries. Behind the fifth New York, the ground sloped down very steeply to Young's Branch, then rose up again to the east with Chin Ridge rising above that. The fifth New York sported collarless, dark blue jackets, vests trimmed in red, blue trimmed red sashes, baggy red trousers, uh, tucked into white canvas leggings, and fezzes with short blue tassels. As the Texas Brigade emerged from the woods that day, it covered a line about 700 yards long with the 5th Texas on the right. Before they moved out, Captain John S. Cleveland, pointing to the regimental flag, exhorted the men, cling to it, boys, he said, as you would your sweethearts. Soon, rank after rank emerged from the trees, yelling their loudest, practically face to face with the Zwabs. Having scattered the 10th New York, known as the National Zwabs, Hood ordered his men to fix bayonets, fire, and charge. The Texans were soon upon Colonel Gouverneur Warren's second line of defense, the 5th New York. When the 10th New York fled, it passed through the ranks of the 5th, uh, 5th New York's line with the Texans close on their heels. The 5th New York could not fire while the 10th New York was still coming through its ranks. The 5th Texas, however, kept up a rapid fire as they advanced, screaming the rebel yell. Finally, in utter desperation, the 5th New York commenced firing, even while some of their fellow New Yorkers were still passing through their ranks. Their first ragged volley went high, merely scattering leaves on the Texans. The Texans, however, responded with an effective fire at less than 100 yards. The Zouaves, standing in the open, made easy targets, particularly with their unusual clothing. During this exchange, Colonel Upton grabbed the colors in his left hand and with a drawn saber in his right, yelled, follow me, boys. He was immediately shot through the, the head and killed. <clears throat> After a single volley, the 5th Texas closed with the Zouaves, Within minutes, the New Yorkers started unraveling from right to left, with the new recruits bolting for the rear. Soon, what was left of the unit broke and ran for their lines. It now became hopeless butchery, the Texans, a Texan later reported. Many of the Zouaves threw down their guns and broke for Young's branch some 200 yards in their rear in small disjointed groups. As the New Yorkers fled down the hill toward Young's Branch, the 5th Texas continued to the slaughter from the ridge's crest. The Zouaves' red trousers and blue jackets made excellent targets. The hillside was soon strewn with the flower of those two regiments. One veteran later observed that it was possible to walk on corpses from the edge of the woods to the creek. A New York veteran later wrote, not only were the men wounded or killed, but they were riddled. The Zouaves continued their flight down the hill and plunged into the water with their large baggy pantaloons filling with water until their legs looked like balloons. Meanwhile, Young's branch literally, literally ran red with blood and was dammed with the bodies of the dead Zouaves. The slaughter at this point was fearful, becoming a sickening spectacle even for the battle-hardened Texans. The fleeing men ran up Chin Ridge, not stopping until they reached the rear lines. Their commander, Colonel Warren, rode up to Drury's son there and in a trembling voice with tears in his eyes uttered, Jake, the old fifth has been annihilated. Only 40 minutes before, the fifth New York had numbered over 500 men. On Henry Hill, less than an hour later, there were initially only 60 present. One Texan, describing the hillside littered with the dead, dying, and wounded Zouaves, indicated that the variegated colors of their peculiar uniforms 
gave the scene the appearance of a Texas hillside in spring, painted with wildflowers of every hue and color. This particular carnage was the largest loss of life for any sing in a single battle for any infantry unit on either side in the entire war. The 5th Texas continued on, hitting line after line of the federal left wing, opening the way for a devastating federal defeat. Flushed with victory, the regiment pressed through the disintegrating federal lines, considerably outdistancing not only the rest of the brigade, but the rest of Lee's army. After the battle, Corps Commander General James Longstreet questioned Brigade Commander John Bell Hood as to the whereabouts of the 5th Texas. Hood replied they had slipped the bridle and were on their way to Washington. Longstreet nodded knowingly and replied, if any men in the world can get there, those are the men. Their actions that day earned the regiment, the sobriquet, the Bloody Fifth, which it wore proudly throughout the remainder of the war. The regiment's accomplishments came with a frightening butcher's bill, however. At the end of the fight, three of its companies had no officers remaining, and all the field grade officers of the regiment were casualties. Seven color bearers fell carrying the regimental flag that day alone. The 5th Texas, the most engaged in the fighting, lost over 260 men, the highest casualty rate in Lee's army. Then at Gettysburg, the regiment faced a next to impossible task, that of taking Little Round Top following its occupation by the Federals. Tasked with venturing across a rocky field for over a mile and then climbing a boulder studded hill while being pummeled by shot and grape from cannon positioned to their left at Devil's Den, sharpshooters in their immediate front and Union troops firing from the, the uh, steep heights above them. General John B. Hood saw the merits of an alternative plan. After several unsuccessful pleas and a formal protest, however, his men went forward nonetheless. The 5th Texas fought off federal sharpshooters and traversed the wooded and extremely rocky terrain leading up to Little Round Top. In the process, it had to negotiate trees, underbrush, and massive boulders the size of small houses. The blaze of the federal fire was devastating, with, one regiment, with the regiment soon losing its color sergeant and the next three color bearers. Despite the desperate nature of their situation, while suffering horrific losses, the men of the 5th Texas never despaired, but gave their utmost to surmount those heights, making three valiant efforts to take the seemingly insurmountable hill. Their final attempt very nearly succeeded, despite overwhelming odds. The regiment, along with three others, broke the right of the Union position atop the rocky ledge and were engaged in winning in hand-to-hand -hand, uh, combat when another federal brigade arrived at the scene at the last possible moment. The persistent 5th Texas suffered terribly for its efforts that day, more than any other re uh, regiment in Lee's army. Uh, entering the battle with 409 men and losing 211, or 52%, including 112 men captured. Finally, at the Wilderness on May 6, 1864, Lee had his back to the wall. It was about to be hopelessly overrun. Longstreet's Corps, with the Texas Brigade in the lead, was desperately rushing toward the fight to stem the tide. At the last moment, the Texans, marching from miles away, broke into the clearing in front of the oncoming Federals. A highly agitated General Lee ordered the Texans forward and to give the enemy cold steel. Commander John Gregg shouted, Attention, Texas Brigade, the eyes of General Lee are upon you, and ordered them forward. As the men advanced, however, Lee attempted to lead them 
waving his hat and shouting, Texans always move them. Aware of the obvious danger to their beloved leader, the men of the 5th Texas surrounded Lee and grasped the bridle on his mouth, shouting Lee to the rear. Only after they pledged to drive back the enemy did Lee finally agree to retire. With Lee safely behind the lines, the Texans charged down the Orange Plank Road, sweeping the enemy before them in a savage hail of lead and grape. The advance changed the tide of that battle and impeded Grant's plan uh, to move south. The redoubtable regiment and its brigade had saved Lee's army once again. The cost of their victory was almost more than the unit could bear, however. It entered the fray with over with 180 officers and men, and 111 of them fell in 25 minutes. The 5th Texas lost its commander, along with every one of its regimental officers. The men of the 5th Texas were always ready and eager to enter the thick of the fighting, despite the odds, and never showed the enemy their backs. As the war lingered out, faced with a lack of clothing and shoes, and ultimately food, they nonetheless maintained their devotion to their cause, a faith that they would ultimately prevail and never despaired. Their Elan and fighting spirit continued throughout the war. Even when the, the future seemed hopeless in the spring of 1865, Lee's army even experienced high desertion rates. However, there were none in the 5th Texas. Such men were hard to come by. At Appomattox, the regiment surrendered a total of 13 officers and 148 men. During the war, it had suffered 303 men killed in battle. 280 died of disease, and 663 were wounded. Their fighting spirit remained intact to the end, however, ready to, to enter the next battle. In many respects, their resoluteness typified the motto atop their flag, Vinere sat vincere, to live long enough as to conquer. While they did not win their war, their conquest was in achieving eternal glory in the annals of history. I hope that my uh, little talk has imparted some knowledge and information today for you to gain an appreciation for the exploits of the 5th Texas and its brave men. I thank you for the opportunity and for your attention. Thank you. I, I'm going to just, I think you can hear me in the back, can't you? I'm loud enough. I don't like microphones. Um, when I was invited, I was, it was explained to me this was about Texas and war. And uh, the previous speaker did an excellent ex uh, job of showing you the tenacity, hardships, and sacrifice made by Texans in previous wars. It also is a very good example of here it is 150 years after the Civil War, we're getting very detailed in fairly small units and what they did and exactly how it performed. And that's the way it always happens. Once a war is over, the first stories come out from the journalists. Maybe true, maybe not. The second stories that come out are from the individuals writing what I did in the war. And that's where my first two books came from. They were originally written to give my daughters of what I did in the war. Uh, and after I finished it, I said, this is good. Uh, I've never had any trouble with ego. So I went to the biggest publisher in the world, uh, Random House Penguin in New York, and, and gave it to them. And within six weeks had a contract. The only thing they said, the man manuscript's too long. Can you cut it in half and we'll give you twice as much money? And that didn't take long to make that decision. Uh, I figured once a person goes to war, they've got a book. And I had two and I was finished. But the editor that I had asked me to do one on Rangers in Vietnam. This grew and grew and it just, just hadn't stopped yet. People ask me what I do for a living. I type. And that's what I've done for the last 30 years, 20 years, 25, whatever since I retired from the Army. But I think we always get a flavor from the Civil War books of magnolia blossoms and peaches, horrible casualties, but all this valor and everybody's so brave and good. Uh, I, I disagree with you. 
I disagree with you for a person that's been down in the mud and the blood and the gore of the combat instrument. Uh, I'm also reminded of a book by uh, a fellow named Robert Rourke, who was very popular in the 50s that wrote about Africa. Uh, his, it's a, a novel, but the, the hero of the book is a combat correspondent. And he's been all over the world, and he comes home, and he's been only there a short time, and he comes home and tells his wife he's going to Africa to cover the uh, Mau Mau revolution. And his wife looks at him and picks up items out of the kitchen and starts throwing at him and says, you don't want to go to war, you just want to get out of the damn house. <laughs> and I think that's one of the big purposes these Texans marked off the war. They weren't really opposing slavery, a few of them owned slaves. States' rights was somewhat beyond them. But their community, if you were working out in Columbus, Texas, working on a farm, digging up uh, stumps, uh, maybe fighting Indians, working your ass off from when the sun came up to the sun went down, and you knew somebody came in and said, hey, you want to go to Virginia? You probably grabbed your rifle and got. And, that's, and that was probably my experiences. I grew up on a ranch in West Texas. Wasn't much of a ranch, we didn't have any horses because we didn't have enough money to have horses. We walked to herd the cattle, what few we had. As Soon as I got old enough, I went to A&M because I knew it was a ticket that I could get to the future and I could get a commission in the United States Army and would give me an opportunity uh, to see the world and do things. After writing a number of books, uh, I finally came back to Texas and live on the Bolivar Peninsula now. Uh, my first three books that were published by Random House were, when they went out of print, were repurchased by the Texas A&M University Press and re-released. And A&M Press has been after me a long time to write a book about A&M. Well, I, I didn't want to do it. Uh, it just didn't match. But finally it came up that why didn't I tell the story of A&M in the war the same way that uh, I told mine, just a personal narrative. So I gathered up about 40 people that did anything from drop bombs from 40,000 feet to stay in the rear where they never heard a shot fired to they were ships offshore to a person at the lead company on the charge up Hamburger Hill to the uh, letters from a, a soldier that was killed in Laos back to his wife uh, and her impression on what, was, what occurred. Uh, one of the best stories in the book I start with was a young Marine, that one, a, a platoon leader from A&M, that one of his men was wounded in a minefield, and he went in the minefield to rescue him and bring him back. And it was shot, uh, a head of mine himself, was badly uh, wounded, and said as he lay there, uh, he, he thought he was gonna die. And then he all of a sudden he heard, his radio operator said, we're gonna try to get a helicopter in. No landing zone, it's the middle of the jungle. And at that time, the Marine Corps was not allowing them to use a jungle penetrator, which meant they dropped the cable down, picked up a letter, and picked you back up through the trees because it had so many helicopters get shot down doing it. The, the young man, my friend Mike Begg, says, I'm dead. But suddenly he heard that helicopter coming in. And the helicopter disobeyed the regulations, dropped the cable, picked him up, and Mike Beggs is alive today. 30 years later, Mike Beggs is at an A&M reunion and he starts telling this story. And he says, you know, if that helicopter pilot had made that decision, I'd be dead today. I sure wish I knew who he was. His call sign was Peach Tree something like that. I can't remember exactly, it's in the book. And across, and the guy listening to it said, yeah, I remember it, I flew that helicopter. Uh, an Aggie rescue on an Aggie. I remember a time, uh, on July 3rd, 1969, we had a two-day battle with the North Vietnamese Regiment. We had nine killed and about 30, 40 wounded. We killed a lot of them. Uh, at the end of the battle, they, we blew a landing zone so we could bring in a helicopter and start extracting all the weapons and documents and all that we'd captured. On the last flight, the helicopter came up, flew into the trees, fell over its side, killed one crew member and injured some of the others. Uh, when an aircraft crashes, all kind of people start coming in to, to see what the, happens so they can do it. Well, they sent out the investigator. He looked at it and he said, boy, he said, this shouldn't have happened. He said, but I think that what's left, the, the helicopter didn't burn. He said, I think it's salvageable. We'll take this helicopter with a larger helicopter. We'll pick it up, but it'll be tomorrow afternoon before we can do it. Well, we've been out there about two weeks then 
uh, in the battle with nine dead and 30, 30 plus wounded. One guy, Michael L. Fallon of uh, Richmond, Virginia, received the Medal of Honor for his bravery during the fight. And, and we, were, uh, we were pretty well whipped. We were, mentally and physically, we were in bad shape. And I looked at that investigator and I saw his Aggie ring. And I went up to him and I introduced myself. I was a lieutenant, he was a colonel, a major. And I told him everything had been happening. I said, you sure that helicopter is salvageable? And we went back and looked at it. And he said, what do you know about demolitions? And I said, I'm an expert, I'm Fort Benning trained. And he said, well, you put a two pound block of C4 right here and blow it up and let's all go home. And we did it, blew that helicopter up, million and a half dollars of your tax dollars money. And that afternoon, that evening, we got fresh clothes and a hot meal back in a fire base. Uh, Aggies helping Aggies. But I think one thing we need to know, the difference between what happened in the Civil War and what happened in Vietnam was it was not all that many volunteers coming forward to jump on the bandwagon to fight the war. Uh, Texas was number three in casualties. 3,100 plus died in Vietnam uh, with California and New York just because of their larger populations. Uh, there were a lot of volunteers, but there were also a lot of draftees. But ultimately, who fought the war and who represented Texas? If you look at uh, who lost the most people, West Point, Military Academy, obvious. Second, uh, the Air Force Academy. Third, the Naval Academy, primarily the Marines, not their Navy guys, because they were out sitting on their wardroom on the ships. Now, you take the typical military places that you think, the Citadel in, in uh, South Carolina had 76 die. The v uh, VMI 43, North Georgia 27, Norwich University 19. If you take MIT, Princeton, and Harvard combined, they had 20 men die in Vietnam. Texas A&M lost 106 on the battlefield from casualties. They lost another 80 in training and disease and illness, either in Germany, the United States, or other places during the war. So almost 200 Aggies died in the war. Who else contributed from Texas to maintain this tradition of the 5th Texas? Who stepped forward from the universities? Well, they can't tell you because they don't know and they don't care. That's from very specific finding and a lot of questions. I did find out that Texas Christian University and Texas Tech say they think they lost seven to 10 each. University of Texas, or TU as we call it at A&M, how many do you think they lost? On their website, they proudly say they had four men die in Vietnam. So who took the brunt of the Vietnam War? The same young men that marched off to World War I and World War II in mass, and the same people that represent this state in the military in high ranks today. And that was where, as an Aggie, and from that, I got the influence to write the book. The, end book, tell, the book tells the story across the board of all kind of jobs, from, from down in the trenches to high in the skies, from basically most of the, uh, the military ranks, uh, and gives you a good overview. 100 years from now, they'll have a conference and somebody will be probably give a specific history about my old unit, the 199th Light Infantry Brigade. But this, we're still in that process of doing it. Most of you know that Ken Burns probably uh, is having uh, his Civil War, baseball, whatever you call it, documentary that's gonna be on TV here, I think in uh, a month or two. Uh, I give you fair warning when you look at it, I haven't seen it, but I can tell you for the people he interviewed that he's taking a very liberal slant on the Vietnam War. Uh, the people he interviewed were more, more as many protesters as there were combat people. Uh, I don't think Mr. Burns knows anything more about Vietnam than he does anything else, but I'll wait and see it before I make any unkind comments to Mr. Burns. Then I'll say he's an asshole, uh, <laughs> but not until. Uh, why, why, or why am I so adamant on it? Well, because 106 of my fellow Aggies died in Vietnam. My best friend in high school, Delma Reed, died in the, with the Marine Corps in 1966 up on the DMZ. My best friend in the Army, Bill Little, died on November 11th, 1969. It took us two days fighting to recover his body from the enemy. 
My best friend at A&M, Dave Smith, died with the lead company under the Cambodian invasion of 1970. Uh, he never married, he never had any children, he only had his mother, and uh, his, his generation is gone because of the war. But everyone has believed it, and we, I have no regrets, I have no apologies, uh, and I have nothing whatsoever to think about other than kind of like when that guy walked in his wife's kitchen and said, I'm going to war. Uh, it was as much to get out of the house, see the world. I didn't want to miss the greatest event of my generation. I didn't want to go to graduate school and become a, a unfortunately, uh, most of the people that lead the universities of my generation, a lot of them are retired now, most of them got their PhDs and EEDs, so they'd get to be 26 and wouldn't be drafted. Same with people that went to law school, people that delayed going because they could delay till they were 26 and not be there. All I can say is they don't know what they missed. Uh, I, uh, I wouldn't give it for, uh, the, the experience up for anything. Uh, uh, I've never missed a night's sleep. Uh, and like I said, I have no regrets and uh, nothing to be unhappy about. I appreciate the opportunity of speaking today. Uh, and uh, you should hear me sometime when I really get on a high horse. <laughs>